everybody, and welcome to God's house as we celebrate the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. And uh, today we're continuing our journey through some hymns that a lot of fo some folks don't know. They're from the 19th century and of uh, America, and uh, we have two of them for the day. So we're going to begin with the pre-service song. It's entitled Grace Alone. Please join us. If For those of you at home, I hope you have a worship folder in hand. So let us sing. Grace alone. <laughs> have your worship folder with you there is a prayer before worship so would you please join me and let us pray dear Lord Jesus we thank and praise you that you call us to come and follow you we thank, thank you dear, dear Holy Spirit, Spirit for, for opening our, our hearts, hearts and minds to see the need for our Savior and, and to come and receive him as the Lamb, Lamb of God, God who takes away Jesus. our sin we thank, thank you, you, dear Lord, for how you heart. take what is little, what is lowly and despised in this world, and make it great. Use us, who often have very little, to do great things in your kingdom. May you say to each of us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen. Our theme today is be happy and holy in God's service just where you are. And our hymns and songs fit that theme. We begin with the opening song, Here I Am. You may stand for this opening song. Whom 
shall I send? Here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you time together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please continue. If, if we say we have no sin, sin we, we deceive, deceive ourselves, ourselves, and the, the truth, truth is, is not in us. us. But, but if, if we, we confess, confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We observe a moment of silence for private confession. And we continue on the next page. Most merciful God, we confess that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For but for the sake, sake of your, your Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, have mercy on us, forgive, forgive us, us, renew us, and lead us, so, so that, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his great mercy, gave his Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and for me. And for his sake he does forgive us all of our sins. So as a called and ordained servant of God's holy word, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. 
Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the people of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We sing the three verses of the hymn of praise, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You came into this world, born in Bethlehem of, of Judea, of Galilee, and you came to give up your life on the altar of the cross. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have called us to follow you, to trust in you as the one who gave up his life for us. And so help us, dear Lord, to serve you, to live our lives and to be a blessing in the lives of those around us, but also to serve you in your kingdom and use the gifts you have given us. Bless our time together this day. Fill us with your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and we will continue with the uh, gospel lesson. So before we go on with the gospel lesson, we do this crazy thing called the peace wave. So go ahead, do the peace wave. Hello, good morning. I'll be glad when we can shake each other's hand and uh, give each other a hug once in a while. All right, so if you have your uh, Bibles, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 18, and uh, this is the gospel lesson chosen for the day, and it will come and fit the theme for uh, the second hymn uh, or song of the day, okay? So Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 7, or 1 through 6, let me read. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> so Jesus called a little child, had him stand among them, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. This is the gospel of our Lord. So our hymns today fit together. And they have to do with serving God and living in a relationship of faith just as we are and just where we are. All right? So many times we humans, we love to complain. I thought about asking the question, how many of you have never complained in your life? But then we would add the sin of lying to the list. The reality is we become disgruntled and upset quite easily. Some of us are very gifted at that, more so than others. But we become disgruntled and upset because life is not the way I want it. You ever have your kids say that to you? Daddy, Mommy, I don't like the way things are. You know, and you wanted to say, well, <laughs> neither do we. And you're part of the problem. The reality is that we, we get that way. And we get feelings of depression and anger and a sense of uselessness. And we get angry because God hasn't allowed all good things to come to us. And bad things have happened. And we get angry about all that. And we may have to struggle through some hard times. Oh, and of course, we wouldn't want to do that. If you, I don't know if you watch commercials and things on television, but it drives, drives me nuts. No one wants to suffer anything or endure any hardships. This last week, I was visiting with someone in the congregation, and we talked about this hymn series I'm going through. And he said to me, one thing I'm impressed with, Pastor, is how tough these people were that wrote these hymns in the 19th century in America. And I got to say amen to that. You know, when you go through these hymns and the people who wrote them, almost all of them come out of a difficult, painful situation. Like Horatio Spafford, who lost his four young daughters on, on, in the middle of the Atlantic uh, while he was in the United States. And then you have, uh, what was the gal last week? Fanny Crosby. Remember her? How many hymns did she write? Eight, you're the only one that remembers. Everybody's, well, a couple. She wrote 8,000 hymns. Amazing. And she was blind from birth and lived 95 years in this world. And we have a similar example today. The point is that these people came through terrible times and difficulties. And I'm sure they complained. Our gal today, I'm sure she did, and we know she did. But the reality is they turned the negative into a positive, not only for themselves, but for those around them. So the first song we're going to deal with is Just As I Am Without One Plea, okay? And I want to read to you the text on which it is based. It is John, excuse me, John chapter 6. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. All that the Father gives will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. So our first hymn for the day was written by Charlotte Elliott. And Charlotte was born in 1789. She wrote this hymn in 1836. She was born in England. And Charlotte was one of those, I don't know how I should phrase this, but she was born into a family of preachers. You ever met anybody like that? They're a different lot. They're a different lot. Her grandfather was a very famous preacher in England. I think his last name was Venn. And then she grew up with two brothers who became preachers. Can you imagine having two brothers who are preachers? That must have been a difficult thing in and of itself. Anyway, Charlotte, as she grew up as, as a young girl, she was known as Carefree Charlotte. 
and she was very popular. She was an artist, a portrait, uh, did portraits of individuals, and she was a writer of humorous verses. But around the age of 30, I think she was 32, a serious illness came over her, and she became disabled for the rest of her life, 50 some years. She died in her 80s. She became bedridden and endured periods of great physical suffering. And this, of course, led to feelings of despondency, rage, and inner conflict. And I want to read to you what Charlotte wrote. And thank God for the internet. You can find stuff that I would never have found otherwise. But let me read what she wrote. Charlotte writes, God knows, and he alone. He knows what it is day after day, hour after hour, to fight against bodily feelings of almost overpowering weakness, languor, and exhaustion. To resolve not to yield to sloth slothfulness, depression, and instability, such as the body causes me to indulge. But for me to rise every morning, determined to take this for my motto, Jesus said, if a person will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me me. I'm sure that Charlotte had some dark moments in her life, and we know that she did. But she had a friend. He was from Switzerland. He was an evangelist. His name was Cesar Milan. And Cesar came to England to visit her. One day he told her, Charlotte, you must come just as you are to Jesus with all your struggles, with all your pain, you must just come to him as you are. And Charlotte did. And that was a come to Jesus moment in her life. I don't know if any of you have had those moments. It's not a, Charlotte was a believer. She knew the Lord Jesus. She was raised in a Christian home. But she went through this terrible moment, time in her life that endured for 50 years. But she had that moment where she had a new relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Her relationship was here, but now it became much deeper. And she had this deep come to Jesus moment. I don't know if any of you have had that moment in your life. I have. It comes when you're a teenager or it comes in your 20s where, God, where all of a sudden, Jesus becomes so much more than he used to be. And it becomes so much deeper. And that happened to Charlotte. So you know what Charlotte did? Anybody want to guess? She wrote hymns. Yeah. She wrote 150 of them. She wasn't quite as, quite as many as Fanny. But she wrote 150 of them. She also wrote about 10 books. I, I can't get my hand on all the number. But then she became the editor for 25 years of a periodical. Catch the name. This is in the mid-1800s. The periodical's name was The Invalid's Hymn Book. But that's a great title, isn't it? The Invalid's Hymn hymn book. I found it on a PDF on Google, all right? And I want to read to you a little description of this, the Invalid's Hymn Book periodical of which she was the editor for 25 years. The hymn book is for the use of persons in great bodily weakness. There are large print hymns, that makes sense, to cheer and animate the weak, to strengthen the faith, to clear the view of the glorious doctrine of atonement, 
which alone can give peace to the guilty conscience and cause a sinner to triumph in Christ. One of the things I've learned about all of these authors, the thing that got them through is what we have just here. They go back to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the atonement, that Christ died for them, and now Christ is working in them to change them and to use them just as they are and just where they are. <coughs> Charlotte's hymns were simple and devotional, and they were full of comfort and consolation for the sick and the sorrowful. She is considered one of the finest English hymn writers. She wrote, God's grace surrounds me. His voice continually bids me to be happy and holy in his service just where I am. Now, I want you to turn in your worship folder to the hymn, Just As I Am, okay? Fellas, I, if you want to come on up, we're going to sing it in a little bit. But I want you to think about this. Notice the refrain, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. That is a refrain of the gospel foundation, okay? O Lamb of God, I come. Now I want you to look at verse 1. Verse 1 has, uh, but that thy blood was shed for me. Look at verse 2. Just as I am and waiting not to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot. Again, I can't impress upon us enough the central foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? Now look at verse 3. Verse 3 and 4 can speak of her background. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict and many a doubt, fightings and fears within without, O Lamb of God, I come. Read verse 4 with me, would you? Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come. Now think about that. She finds the healing for her health, for her attitude in the Lamb of God. Everybody catch that? Okay? And then lastly, the fifth verse. So let us sing, okay, the five verses of Just As I Am Without One Plea. Fellas, go ahead.
guys can just stay. This won't be too long. So our gospel lesson was about the little ones. And that term, I guess we could use of children, but also it's really used of lowly Christians in a demeaning sense, okay? And many of you know in the history of Christianity, Christians were looked down upon. Not uncommon today. But theologically, in the scriptures, God calls the weak and the poor and those with little to accomplish great things. We live in a world, let me read this, a world that says bigger is better. And the more we have, the better life is. The Bible is totally different. And if I want to go back to that gospel lesson, Jesus, he pulls a little child, and he says to his disciples, unless you change, which means you're thinking of big and glorious stuff, you got to become like a little child. Let me give you some examples. Littleness in the Bible is the way to greatness. Moses, when God, when God chose Moses, what did, he give, what did God give Moses? A staff, a stick. And with that stick, Moses divided the Red Sea, saved the children of Israel. With that stick, Moses struck the rock, and water came out of the rock. Well, let's talk about David. When David faced Goliath, what did he use? A little smooth stone. By the way, he had five of them in his bag. He only used one, and Goliath went down with the slingshot. David kills Goliath. Uh, Gideon, remember Gideon? He went against the Midianites. They had an army of 130-some thousand men, and Gideon had how many men? 300. And when God says, you can send everybody else away, the 300 is enough. And with that, he defeats the Midianite army. Oh, remember the boys' lunch? That's our picture. If you want to show that picture, Stephen, on the sheet, on the screen. Little as much when God is in it. What did that little boy have? Five little loaves of bread, five little rolls, and two fish. And out of that, God feeds what? 5,000, okay? So little as much. Then Jesus uses this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a, what kind of seed? A mustard seed, which is the smallest seed but it grows into the largest tree in the garden. Okay? I, got, I think I got one more. St. Paul says, God chooses the foolish and the weak things of this world to shame the wise and the strong. And finally, tell me this side. Where, what town was Jesus born in? Huh? Bethlehem. Why wasn't he born in Jerusalem? That would have been better. That would have been bigger, but he chooses little Bethlehem. In fact, that's what the Bible says. The point is, folks, a little bread, a little army, a little seed, a little staff is much more when God is in it, okay? And we need to remember that. These words and music were written by Kitty Suffield. She was born in 1884. I think she came from New York City. She was a very talented musician and singer. She was, and so I forget, a color, a color ester singing. Isn't there a musical term for that? That means a what? Coloratura. Coloratura, which means she had the ability to sing the soprano voice higher than most, correct? Yeah, so she was highly gifted and had a great career ahead of her as a musician. So what do you think happened to Kitty, Kitty Suffield? She met a man. No, she didn't lose her voice. <laughs> she met a man. Let me tell you the story. So one snow-blanketed night... Canadian, if you've ever been in Canada, you know they get a lot of snow. Fred Suffield woke up at the urgent pounding on the door of his house. 
A half-frozen man reported that a train was stalled in the blizzard on the railroad tracks down the way. See, we don't even think of that in California, do we? But it was. And the passengers were in danger of what? Freezing. Freezing to death. So the man asked Fred, could they come and spend the night in your house? So what does Fred do? Fred takes his lantern, walks back to the train, and leads, how many ever there were, I don't know, back to his house, and they spend the night in his house, and then they return. Well, a number of the people sent thank you notes. And guess who else sent a thank you note? Oh, Kitty. Kitty wrote a letter, he wrote a letter back, uh, romance started, and they got married. And when they got married, they, Kitty gave up her promising career, and they became traveling evangelists. Now, let me tell you this story. One, they were, they were in Ottawa, and there was a pastor, Shea, there, S-H-E-A. And he had a son, so Kitty and her husband, Fred, they invited their, that young man, his son, to come to their place and sing in some evangel evangelistic uh, events. His name was George Beverly Shea. And as a young man, so let me read to you this. He spent a, a month with them. One night, he was accompanied by Kitty on the piano. So Beverly Shea, uh, George Beverly Shea attempted to sing, but his voice cracked on the high notes. He sat down mortified vowing never to sing again. Kitty wouldn't hear of it. So she lowered the key. He began to sing, and he kept on singing and singing and singing until he became part of Billy Graham's Crusades. Remember that? All right, George Beverly Shea. If you've heard him sing, had a powerful baritone voice. Kitty wrote many songs. One of them was God is still on the throne on his throne, and little is much when God is in it. So I want you to look at the hymn. Would you look at the verses with me? There are four of them. And this hymn talks about being involved in God's harvest field. Just like Charlotte. Okay? It is I come just as I am and just where I am. In the harvest field now ripen, there's work for all of us to do. God is calling you and me, calling us to the harvest, okay? Look at verse 2. Does the place where you're called seem so small and little known? Kind of like the missionary stuck out there somewhere, God knows where, out in the world, forgotten by most people, all right? If it, it is great if God is in it, and he'll not forget his own. Look at verse 3. Are you laid aside from service? Is your body worn from toil and care? You can still what? Be in the battle, in the sacred what? Place of prayer. When the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is done, he will say, if you are faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. The point of all of this is that you and I, no matter where we are in our life, God gives us a mission and a purpose in his kingdom, just like Charlotte, just like Kitty, and just like all these other people. And the point of it is, you and I need to recognize that. We need to recognize that God has a ministry for us. I was talking to somebody who sends out cards just sends out cards to people. That's a ministry. And you know, that ministry can become great if what? If God is in it. If you've ever had that, if you made a phone call to someone and it was just perfect timing and you brought comfort to that person, that's an example where God is in it. Okay, everybody understand that? God is in your ministry, whatever that is whether it's teaching, whatever it may be, God is in that in your life. And that is the great challenge for you and me. It's not about me. It's not about fame. It's not about money. 
It's about serving God where I am, as I am. And when he is in it, it becomes so much more. As someone else wrote, but no ministry is worth much if God is not in it. So let's sing the hymn. I found out a lot of people have not heard of this hymn. I don't think anybody here has heard of it, huh? It was written, and oh, one more thing. Guess where Kitty is buried? Hang on, hang on, Jim. Kitty is buried in the San Fernando Valley. She's buried at Forest Lawn in Glendale. I'm going to have to go and look at her grave. Um, she died in 1972. So let's sing Little Is Much. Go ahead, Jim. Sorry. Play through the whole thing. Offering for the day, uh, the offering uh, box is here. We'll take a moment so that we can put up a slide on the uh, screen, and uh, we'll we'll have the offering, and then continue with the prayers for the day. in your uh, worship folder under the faith and fellowship page 
and you'll see the uh, names of individuals. Uh, I understand Daniel is having surgery this week, so we need to keep him in our prayers. And I'm going to give you a chance to uh, pray for these individuals on your own, and um, then I will have some other prayers, okay? So let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, you have called us, each of us, to the ministry of prayer. Forgive us, dear Lord, when we forgot all about that, when we thought that was somebody else's job and not ours. Or forgive us, dear Lord, when we only pray when we want something and we care little about the needs of others. And so today, dear Lord, we take time. Again, we're tested to take time to pray for people in need. So help us and hear us as we take this time to pray for the folks on this list and for others we know who need our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. We also pray this day, dear Father, for the ministry of our preschool as it begins another year this coming Tuesday. Dear Lord, we thank you for the staff. We thank you for the families, the children, the parents that have been part of that ministry since 1983. And we pray, dear Father, that you would bless us again that you would bless us this year with a full house of children and families. Dear Lord, we pray that as we open our doors this week, you will lead many others to come here so that we may be about your work of caring for these children, but also sharing with them and their families the love of Jesus for them, teaching them songs like, Jesus loves me, this I know, and teaching them to pray. Dear Lord, dear Heavenly Father, we pray that over these next weeks, you will fill the rooms of our preschool, that it may continue to be a great blessing in the lives of many. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayers. prayers. We also pray this day, dear Heavenly Father, for the elections that are coming in these United States of America in the months ahead. Dear Lord, we pray for all of them on the local, on the state and national level. We pray that our American people will be informed as they go to the voting booth and vote. We pray that we will vote our conscience. We, will, we pray that we will take our vote and our responsibility seriously. So be with this nation of ours, dear Lord. Help us to be a united, States of America, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Into your hands, dear Heavenly Father, we commend all for whom we pray as we join to pray. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit bless you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. So we invite you to uh, read the announcements that are... Um, uh, in your worship folder and hope you got these this week uh, in the news or through the mail uh, or over the internet and through the mail. And uh, Jesus bless you as we enter the new month of September and uh, let's close with the closing hymn. Okay? One, two, three. <laughs> Jesus.
Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. I comfort my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to work. everybody and Jesus bless you. to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise you, the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your 